Hello, everyone. Uh, as you know, I'm Keith Kimito, president of Lifespan.io. Uh, and in this talk, I'm going to switch gears a little bit from the past couple of ones to expand upon some of the things I mentioned in my opening remarks yesterday. In particular, how emerging tools such as dynamic NFTs and game-based philanthropic mechanisms can support longevity biotechnology and decentralized science more broadly, and in ways which can also inspire the public while doing so. But before diving into the new stuff, it's useful to understand the tools that have already been used to crowdfund and crowdsource support for aging research. So, as many of you might know, when Lifespan.io first started, we began as a crowdfunding platform like Kickstarter or Indiegogo, but which focused specifically on aging research. And this was largely successful. And we began in this way in conscious emulation of the early cancer research advocates like Mary Lasker and Sidney Farber who came before, who were incredibly successful in transforming cancer research into a national priority based on their initiatives. And what's interesting is they basically followed, whether intentionally or not, a three-step battle plan, each building on each other. One, identify the credible research of the time. For them, it was early chemotherapy. Two, build a grassroots movement around the support of it, which included crowdfunding back in the day. For them, it was telethons and the Jimmy Fund, et cetera, if anybody remembers those. And three, leverage that built community and early results to affect large-scale change, such as essentially pressuring President Nixon into signing the 1971 Cancer Act, which was the birth of the war on cancer. Now, with emerging technologies, we can activate and accelerate this very same process for longevity. Namely, we'll discuss new types of dynamic NFTs, regenerative funding models for public goods involving them, how such mechanisms can be used to engage the public through philanthropic games, and lastly, how this all paves the way for new kinds of decentralized clinical trials never before seen. This will not be an in-depth tech talk like some of the ones that came before, given the mixed crowd and the fact that some of this was covered yesterday by Omar, but rather a presentation of the overall concepts and how we're planning to leverage these concepts for longevity and hopefully give you ideas to do the same. First, a super quick primer on non-fungible tokens or NFTs, which essentially are just a unique identifier in a blockchain, typically tied to a unique digital asset. Think like a digital baseball card. For some examples, these are uh, the CryptoPunks, some of the first popular series of NFTs. Uh, interesting fun fact side note, these are definitely inspired by the Commodore 64 game Maniac Mansion by Lucasfilms, if anybody remembers that. I'm outing myself a little bit in my age category. Uh, and I believe the currently uh, the average sale price for one of these is over 120,000 uh, right now, dollars. Uh, now, some of you who are new to this might have just done a little bit of a spit take, wondering how can that be possible? And even many, <laughs> even many cryptocurrency natives are not sold on the promise of NFTs, thinking them just nonsensical art with no real utility. But can we do more? As an answer to this question, dynamic NFTs are starting to emerge that are no longer just static JPEGs, for example, but are coded with the ability to change based on external conditions. A few examples of dynamic NFTs are art blocks, which is a series of generative art that can change based on parameters such as time of day, for example. Or the, the artist Beeple's Crossroads, which was coded to change its art based on the results of the 2020 election in the US. And more recently, these uh, dynamic NFT monster characters in the game Axie Infinity, which some of you might know, uh, which can gain functionality through repeated play, similar to a character in a traditional role-playing game. Now, this is undoubtedly interesting to some of you perhaps, uh, but are there ways to create more direct real world utility regarding public goods like increased health and longevity by leveraging these sorts of powers of dynamic NFTs? And the answer is yes. And one way we can do this is by pairing the dynamic aspects of NFTs to philanthropic actions that benefit society, such as with the proof of philanthropy prototype NFT that we've been debuting at the conference and you can check out in the workshop or the booths. Uh, which myself and Omar from WeaveChain have worked on together to create, uh, as demonstrated earlier, and that scale in power and aesthetics based on tracked on-chain giving to our work fighting age-related diseases at Lifespan.io. And which includes amazing art from Colton Orr, as I mentioned earlier, based on one of humanity's very first symbols related to life extension and cyclic renewal, the Ouroboros, 
uh, which I just learned as a random side note, is likely to be the name of Ki Hui Kwan's character in the upcoming series of the Marvel show Loki. Uh, interesting synergy, perhaps. But back to the Ouroboros NFT. Uh, this unique and limited prototype NFT is built on Polygon and changes its graphical representation based on the total amount transacted from the wallet which holds the NFT to a specific smart contract address associated with Lifespan.io. So, for example, if you go to pop.lifespan.io by scanning this QR code and mint a free proof of philanthropy NFT, except for the minor gas, uh, when you receive it in your wallet, it will be darkened, uh, the darkened version of the Ouroboros graphic. And then, if the wallet which holds the NFT sends enough cryptocurrency to the specified lifespan.io wallet address, the NFT's art will upgrade accordingly, allowing the donor to clearly display their contributions to a worthy cause and become eligible for commensurate perks in the future. And with this change being visible on NFT marketplaces such as OpenSea as well, hitting refresh metadata if necessary. Now, while this mechanism is itself already useful in terms of raising funds for aging research from the cryptocurrency community, and I hope that many of you will help us, even if you're new, by trying out one of these dynamic NFTs and getting onboarded to learn about this technology, we can also use this support to go further and build upon this base concept in forthcoming and future projects. For example, we can pair dynamic NFTs with narrative elements, such as with the Lifespan Legends, a series based on 25 characters from literature, mythology, and history, who have all in some way stood against age-related disease and death, such as Gilgamesh, the king, subject of the very first epic in human history, or Mary Shelley, who wrote Frankenstein, my favorite book of all time, the 13th century alchemist, Roger Bacon, who, side note, may have created lasers, Kaguya of Japanese folklore, princess of the moon, who gave the elixir of life to the emperor who destroyed it because he could not be with her. And on a darker note, Elizabeth Bathory, the countess of blood, the historical inspiration of all vampires and apparently parabiosis. <laughs> One of the novel key aspects of this NFT series is that the character art itself will age over time through a series of discrete steps, perhaps, young, middle, old, or more continuously using AI techniques such as you're seeing here. The agent could then be reversed by a user taking a thematically appropriate action, such as donating to Lifespan.io, a charity working on aging research. Related perks of the NFTs and other elements can change with age state as well. For example, there could be a backside with interesting lore about the character and their quest against aging, like the old Magic the Gathering cards, which changes as the NFT changes. As you can see, there are already great possibilities with combining these approaches to create dynamic NFT series that are both philanthropic and cool, but can we go beyond this and achieve more utility? And the answer is again, yes. And one way to do this is by extending a concept put forth last year by Ethereum co-founder and supporter of aging research, Vitalik Buterin, of soul-bound NFTs, which are basically NFTs that cannot be traded after acquisition. Similar to how certain items would work in old games like World of Warcraft, uh, and useful for cases like proof of attendance NFTs, such as the fact that you've attended this event. That's not something that should be tradable. It's unique to you. But this concept can become even more interesting if we modify it slightly into NFTs which are still tradable, but whose dynamic elements are based on soulbound calculations. This could be called partial or semi-soulbound, but in keeping with the video game references, I decided to go with demi-soulbound NFTs. And if you understand why, congratulations, you are also a nerd. I see that Jelani is a nerd in the crowd because he's smiling. <laughs> As an example of demi soulbound NFTs, consider the case from earlier when a user had acquired a proof of philanthropy NFT and powered it up with donations. If that donor then transferred that NFT to someone else, someone who has not made any donations yet, then the pop NFT would once again become black, waiting to be powered up again by the new donor. Now, coupling this with the fact that transactions and transfer history are knowable on the blockchain, this can create interesting ways for philanthropists to induce others to become philanthropists. So, for example, say Vitalik gets the POP NFT and fully powers it up, uh, verifiable on chain, and then throws it into my wallet. Now it's on me to power it up, and everyone can see that <laughs> and transfer it to someone else to do the same. So this allows uh, people who say that they care about a cause to prove that they actually do, put their money where their mouth is. 
Additionally, the ability for NFTs to change based on donation history can be built upon to create new regenerative funding models which can support longevity research, such as a forthcoming model called Ouroboros that we've been working on with many other organizations in the Web3 public goods funding space, which involves an expanded version of this proof of philanthropy NFT described earlier, such that its level is not just based on a user's total donations, but an average of recent donations. For example, the total amount donated from a year ago until today. So this incentivizes recurring donations, which are the lifeblood of any nonprofit, to upkeep the NFT and clearly express your continued support. The donated funds can then enter not just a normal bank account, but a philanthropic endowment, like a college's endowment, administered by Web3 organizations such as Angel Giving and Endowment, DAO Endowment, where the funds can reinvest in themselves, compounding through mechanisms such as staking, diversifying into bonds, matched from aligned organizations like VitaDAO, et cetera. A lot of opportunities here to create a rising tides raises all boats situation. And furthermore, the NFT holders can comprise a voting DAO that decides how the funds accumulated in this treasury should be dispersed to on-mission projects. And because this treasury is owned by a 501c3 nonprofit as a restricted fund, it keeps everything on the rails. If the DAO somehow votes on an off-mission thing like giving the money to Wendy's or something like that, the charity can veto this and call for a re-vote. And on the flip side, uh, the DAO members know that the charity has to disperse the treasury funds for only that restricted purpose of the project to support. And lastly, very interestingly here, this structure also makes it very easy for large brands to provide additional perks to the NFT holders. A company like Disney, for example, could easily decide they want to honor all of the platinum level philanthropists in the world with a discount on a cruise. And all they would have to do is just simply observe this one proof of philanthropy NFT to do that. Now, obviously this is just a big picture view of the model, but the punchline is that Ouroboros is a mechanism to create a coordinated and force multiplying way to raise funds for the entire field of longevity at once. And if you want to help or learn more, please talk to me. Again, we're working with many organizations across the whole field here together on this. Speaking of help, I'd like to give a big thank you to specific Web3 organizations who have been working with myself and Lifespan.io as we build out these concepts, such as WeaveChain, Angel Giving, Endowment, VitaDAO, Gitcoin, and many others. Next, to switch gears a bit, I want to describe a completely different way we can use dynamic NFTs to increase healthy human longevity. I think most of us, or at least on the crypto side, are familiar with move and earn projects like Steppen on the Solana blockchain where users can equip NFTs that allow them to earn cryptocurrency by walking or running. Uh, but we can actually go much further than this, making NFTs whose dynamic traits are based on your physiological traits, something which I've been calling bio-avatar NFTs. For example, consider if your character in a game like Axie Infinity was well-rested with extra health and power only if you are well rested, or stronger if you've been doing your push-ups, incentivizing uh, you to take care of yourself. And in fact, we've been working with Web3 organizations such as MeBots to make this kind of functionality already a reality. And you can see how this idea can even apply to some of the earlier concepts we discussed, such as the lifespan legends, where you could reverse the aging state of the NFT and achieve upgraded perks, etc., through your own exercise, in addition to donating, creating organic incentive models for people to take care of their own health. And this type of functionality will also have a big part to play in the next topic I'd like to discuss, how blockchain-based games can create new forms of decentralized fundraising for public goods and science through an example of one of our own projects. As announced yesterday, at Lifespan.io, now together with Skullcap Studio, we are working on a game project that can incorporate the philanthropic and health-inspiring mechanics we've just gone through to create something potentially amazing for the field of longevity research, Dragon Tyrant the Game. As outlined in my opening talk, Dragon Tyron is based on the well-known fable about why humanity should work on defeating the diseases of aging and death. In this case, it's a metaphor. There's a dragon, people are sacrificing 100,000 people every day to the dragon, some people think the dragon is good, etc., etc. It's a metaphor for aging. Which you may have also seen in a viral YouTube video by CGP Grey that is also related to other viral videos we helped produce at Lifespan.io with amazing channels like Korsgazakt and our own Life Noggin channel. In building off this backstory, Dragon Tyrant will tie together many successful elements from video gaming history from the beginning on forward 
roguelike elements from games like Slay the Spire, contests similar to an old Atari game called Sword Quest, and NFT-based play-to-earn mechanics. All together into an amazing roguelike contest where players collaborate and compete to be the first to defeat an ancient enemy of humanity and win extraordinary riches by contributing to an NFT-based ecosystem that simultaneously funds charity work to defeat the dragon tyrant of aging in real life as well. To briefly describe these components, as you may be familiar with, there are many games now that are popular, like Slay the Spire, or recently Hades, or a little bit further back in the past, Dark Souls, that are rooted in this one format called a roguelike. This is based off an early ASCII game called Rogue, where your character was literally an at sign uh, in the early days of gaming history. And this typically involves the player grinding down a very difficult dungeon with a built-in cycle of death and rebirth, losing everything and resetting to level one each time but maybe earning a few special items you can bring with you the next time to strengthen your chances. Creating a powerful and tight gameplay loop which is very thematically appropriate for Dragon Tyrant. And without going into the details, it should be very straightforward to imagine how these special items, equipment, player characters, etc., can be NFTs. And similarly, land mechanics such as an upgradable town with different services, a training ground where you can mint characters and taverns by which you can loan them to other players, a vault needed to store special items, and a pocket theory which can provide meaningful but not game-breaking advantages to your party, etc. As all part of a play-to-earn ecosystem, such as those popularized by games like Axie Infinity. Importantly now, some of these NFTs can have demi soul bound bio-avatar properties, putting everything together. For example, consider a sword that powers up based on the number of steps you've taken, and which, if traded or sold to someone else, won't achieve its full power until the receiver does the same. Mechanics like this, again, create organic incentives which promote players' real-world health and generate a sense that you actually are the hero, physically, fighting the Dragon Tyrant. And these incentives are only magnified by the third major component of the game, the fact that slayers of the Dragon Tyrant can win truly amazing prizes and glory. There's actually precedent for this. Uh, for example, years ago, I helped create a game for Major League Baseball called Beat the Streak, in which baseball fans build virtual lineups in the hopes of topping Joe DiMaggio's 56 uh, game hitting streak, winning $5.6 million if they do. As you can imagine, players found this extremely engaging as you feel a little bit extra invested if there's a chance they can win something like that. Uh, and probably the best example of this is going deep back into video game history was this game series on the Atari 2600 back in the late 70s and early 80s uh, called Sword Quest. A super difficult game series in which players competed to figure out these cryptographic ciphers that were hidden in the game. And remember this was before the internet, so very hard and you had no help uh, to ultimately win incredible prizes like a jewel encrusted sword worth millions of dollars in today's money. There's actually a lot of unsolved mysteries and spiciness around how this contest actually ended up, but I'll skip over that for now. Just to say that the overall initiative was an incredibly exciting event in gaming history that got everyone super galvanized. It was kind of like a Willy Wonka golden ticket kind of situation. And definitely was the basis for Ready Player One and that whole contest with the keys and the eggs. Uh, they even referenced uh, an Atari game that was relevant to this in the pivotal scene of that movie, if you remember. And finally, this all combines with the fourth major component that this entire game serves a philanthropic purpose where as players are contributing to the ecosystem, whether they care about longevity or not explicitly, they're building up this incredible prize pool of cryptocurrency that a significant percentage will go to not just the player who wins at last defeating the Dragon Tyrant, but to the research aimed at defeating the Dragon Tyrant in real life. Now, couple this with the fact that successful Web3 games have processed billions of dollars in transaction volume in the past. And you can see what a potential game changer, I just realized now, accidental pun, something like this can be. Now, obviously this is just a 10,000 foot view of the project and skipping over additional elements such as how the Dragon Tyrant emotionally affects and engages the player, narratively appropriate, uh, interesting multiplayer elements and how to protect against cheating and pay to win, etc. Uh, but all told, it's a thrilling roguelike dungeon crawl contest where you can win amazing prizes while contributing to an ecosystem that could save all our lives from disease. Together we're fighting the Dragon Tyrant in the game and in real life, and you can do it with us, you can be your hero, etc. That's the pitch, there we go. <laughs> and if that sounds inspiring to you and you'd like to learn more, I encourage you to speak with myself or Diego and Raphael from Skillcap Studio over at our booth. 
And finally, the last topic I'd just like to touch on is how it may be possible to use games like this to perform decentralized science experiments and maybe even pave the way for true decentralized clinical trials. Consider, for example, our mindset research project at Lifespan.io, which is developing improved non-drug interventions for dementia. Building upon earlier promising work in mice and increasingly humans, that essentially flickering lights and sounds of certain frequencies may actually remediate Alzheimer's disease and other forms of dementia. So now, what if, in Dragon Tyrant, as you progress through the dungeon and get closer and closer to defeating it, the game itself takes on some of these audio and visual stimulus modalities, potentially fighting the Dragon Tyrant in your own body. And since the game would already be immutably tracking things like decision-making speed, longitudinally, that's a cognitive biomarker. So, if we were to structure the game so that that happens, but only for a subset of players, with the others receiving a sham stimulus instead, that starts to sound like the recipe for a decentralized clinical trial administered through a game. And furthermore, this type of data would be ideal to make compliant with Web3 solutions such as WeaveChain, Data Lake, et cetera, have AI analysis performed in it by organizations like Rejuve.ai, and interoperate with decentralized data repositories such as CureDAO, helping to create a whole ecosystem that is greater than the sum of its parts to maximize scientific learning. And if that vision sounds far-fetched to you, it's important to note that there's already precedent for these sorts of large-scale decentralized science projects, such as Foldit and SETI at Home, and most recently and relevantly, mobile games that have been used as diagnostics for early onset Alzheimer's disease, such as the game Sea Hero Quest. That was used by millions of people. And if we can pull something like this off, imagine how inspiring it will be to the public if, after decades and trillions of dollars of taxpayer money yielding little results against dementia, a decentralized group of gamers and DSI enthusiasts on the internet are able to reverse or even mitigate Alzheimer's disease. That would be an earthquake and help catalyze a system-wide shift towards decentralized science. And conversations I've had with legislators, you know, people in uh, government agencies seem open to something like this. So in summary, this has been a glimpse into the future of crowdfunding and crowdsourcing longevity with dynamic NFTs, games for good, and DSI clinical trials. And if you're interested in seeing any of these projects accelerated, here are some ways you can help uh, us at lifespan.io. And to make one last specific call to action, if you haven't yet, please stop by the lifespan.io booth and get the free proof of philanthropy NFT. And power it up if you can, and you'll be part of the history of this new technology. There's only 999 of these limited prototypes, and if every one of these gets powered up all the way, that would be way more than enough. Uh, to drive all the projects that we've talked about here forward to help us all end the diseases of aging together and inspire the public. Thank you. <laughs> we have time for any questions? Or? Thank you, Keith. I think we have time for at least one or two questions. Got one back here. I'm getting two microphones. <laughs> Thanks. Great, Keith. So, uh, as, you, as you know, I know very little about this area, but I noticed on your last slide that the donation made by Omar yesterday of $1,000 is now $1,095 or something like that. Uh, does that mean that the price of these things, the value of these things has actually gone up by, you know, 1% or whatever, or 2% or 10% no, over the past 24 hours? <laughs> so these kind of NFTs are not sort of speculative in nature, uh, you know, that could go up like that. But of course, if people really like them out there, it theoretically could happen, but it's not in any sort of fixed way like this. This NFT right now in its current form is meant for just kind of showcasing your, your donative, um, you know, actions and that you've done that. But future versions of this may start to incorporate more of those elements already, such as that if I do sell one of these NFTs to someone else, a uh, sliver of that transaction itself also goes in as a donation in addition to the transaction, and that can create some kind of speculation and things like this. And the fact that what, I'm, what I want to build on with this later is this example doesn't have it built yet, but you can see how you can visualize provenance, right? 
And you can use this to almost create like philanthropy wars. What if Vitalik Buterin and Charles Hoskinson both get a hundred of these NFTs and throw it to their friends and say, we're gonna try to out, our community is gonna try to outraise their community for this cause. And you could visualize that and create like philanthropy wars. <laughs> so there's a lot of, this is phase one of a multi-step process. I actually have a question and a comment. Um, so the comment is if you, I don't think you've played Slay the Spire because as you play, the game actually just gets harder. So there's more ascension levels and basically you start off with less health or you start off with like worse things or um, you don't heal after a boss fight, which is actually interesting if you compare that with like aging as you age, you're also regenerative properties are a little bit worse. Um, and then my question was related to, uh, well, I guess, Two, maybe. Um, like, are you planning on maybe like combining or like cooperating with uh, visual reality? Visual uh, reality, sorry. Tom. Yeah, <laughs> at, at some point, uh, again, this is a multi step process, so now we're talking about the Dragon Tyrant game. You know, what I presented here was just very much like the high level bird's eye first step. But absolutely, so, so to tie into your point there, now obviously you don't want to make it inaccessible and requiring an augmented reality headset for everyone to use. But yes, as you may or may not be aware, you know, um, certain augmented reality uh, exercises are kind of used to help with certain medical conditions or even things like PTSD, et cetera. So there's certainly the room to add some of those elements into something like this. Again, I'm just a little bit worried about adding too many things at once and you know, building iteratively, get people excited for the first step. Instead of starting with a 100 level dungeon, maybe it's a five level dungeon, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And, and the away. last part is if you are gonna uh, implement the mindset part of it, I would uh, put a warning that absolute People with epilepsy shouldn't play. Yes. Or now, just we'll, have uh, it turn offable as a feature. Yeah, obviously that, that, that's obviously a concern. One thing to note is that um, it, the frequencies that tend to be involved thus far in things like remediating dementia are significantly far apart from the frequencies that induce epilepsy. But of course, you gotta be careful about this stuff. Yeah. I think one more. Time for one last question. Yep, time for one more. Uh, hi, I'm Alexey Podopov. Uh, I have a few startups that do resources, uh, basic resources uh, for the research, uh, computational resources, uh, via decentralizing computation and uh, lab resources. And those are, like right now we have NVIDIA reaching trillion dollars capitalization uh, by selling chips, but the real problem is not the chip shortage, the real problem is chip access shortage. So you buy servers, the servers are inside your lab, inside your data center, and you use it very rarely, and that's why we have uh, the, the, the whole industry buys more chips, but not providing access to the resources. The same is for my lab. I have a lab, it's underutilized, uh, and I'd like to bring, uh, have the marketplace uh, for all my gear, or millions of, of dollars of gear, uh, to share with, with the community, with the, with the projects, with the, uh, with the researchers, particular researchers that need particular device, particular instrument, uh, and uh, it all should be tokenized. I should be able to bring these resources uh, because they are much, much more cheaper than Google, than Amazon providing, uh, they are much cheaper than, because there's a lot of intermediary people that, uh, that profit on me, on, on my investment, mm -hmm. if I, try to sell this, or if I try to rent, there's already a lot of intermediary that make research much expensive that it should. So it's my question to you. Uh, do you plan to kind of have an umbrella, umbrella marketplace, umbrella place for practical people like me to bring resources and to change them? Yes, so to answer that question, uh, this is, again, part of the spirit of this entire event, right, of creating interoperation collaboration points. So as an answer to your question here, something like this may generate a certain type of longitudinal data, like decision-making speed data or something like that, right? And ideally, we would be able to work with organizations like Data Lake and CureDAO to store this information in the proper way, privacy preserve it, to maybe it interacts with things like, you know, if something physical happens, like you were saying, like there's other DAOs, like LabDAO and VitaDAO. So I think based on the conjunction of understanding what the requirements are, seeing what DAOs and decentralized science organizations are out there doing what, because they're 
organizations that are doing kind of the aspects of what you were saying, we can build a consortium that would all kind of pool together to work uh, on something like this and then maybe create a model to create that kind of ability for people to just add on, which is part of the whole spirit of, I think, why we're here. So, good? All right. Thank you. Thanks again, everyone. 